and then we'll get ready to start. Um, so I just want to welcome you all once again. My name is Nelly Businja. I work with the Publisher Chippe International Secretariat as the Member Engagement Manager for Africa, and I am based in Kampala. So it's very good to see you all and meet you all. Um, We've had a number of series, uh, webinar series on uh, energy transition in this, in the context within which we're working in, especially the extractive sector. And we have been at it since April. Uh, so it's really good to see some of you, some familiar names who have been with us since the beginning. This is the last webinar uh, of the series, it's more like a feedback webinar, and so we'll be sharing a number of issues that have come up throughout our discussions. We will not uh, say it's the end, but at least it's it's in terms of where we wanted to go in uh, in the lead up to COP27, which is in a few weeks. Uh, we thought that it was really important to share our feedback and also um, with with our audience and and those who have been attending this series from the beginning. So we will be sharing uh, some of those issues that have come out. And also we have uh, two distinguished speakers who have joined us today to share some perspectives and also because of the experience on COP and also issues to do with uh, some of the things that we're discussing uh, in relation to COP27. I think they'll be very key to add their insights into this discussion. And I'll introduce them uh, a little bit later. But for now, I want us to kick off uh, with uh, just a brief introduction of where we are coming from. And then from there, I'll ask uh, the next speaker also to just continue and share and, and get into the presentation and some of the issues. So please do share the link uh, for the webinar for some of you who have not been able to see it or rather to, for some of you who may want to invite some other people and, and just let them know that we've started. So um, for now, I think, let me invite uh, Moses. Please do introduce yourself again. I'm sure some people already know you, but do introduce yourself and then you can uh, take us through the next uh, session. Yeah, over mm -hmm. to you, Moses. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thanks so much, and Nelly, for that uh, wonderful welcome to all of you. Again, as Nelly has said, uh, my name is Moses Fulaba. I'm the East Africa Regional Manager for NRGI. I have been part of this team, which has been putting together this webinar since March. I'm sure most of you who are joining us for the second time, you must have seen me uh, working together with my colleagues uh, to sort to, 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 to of put together these webinars since when we started on, on this journey in March, early this year. Again, as Nelly has said, we want to thank all of you for having supported this initiative and of course, for standing uh, and sharing your voices, especially as we gear up uh, to COP27, we have received a lot of views and a lot of expertise from different segments across the continent. And we're very delighted this morning to be bringing to you what we managed to gather and collect through this journey. Since we started, this will be the 10th webinar that we are organizing, uh, which sort of really brings us to a climax it's not going to be the end. Definitely after COP, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of discussions and engagements that we uh, engage in uh, on this journey. We would like to thank our experts who shared and spoke during uh, these sessions. And they came from different and diverse backgrounds. And some of the documents and the report that we'll be sharing today is also a combination of their inputs. And of course, we'd like to thank our partners as well and others who are also joining us. Some of them will be speaking today. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Philip from the, the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, Basija, and Ms. Jacqueline Dominique, who is coming from the CAN uh, Climate Action Network uh, Africa, who have also been part of this uh, discussion in the different forums that have been going on across the continent. Let me say that uh, the views that we'll be sharing this morning, as I have said, may not necessarily represent one particular organization, and they may not necessarily present one particular individual kind of positions. There are views that have become from across the continent. And I think what we did as a team was just put them together and saying, perhaps this looks like some kind of a consensus on issues that are coming across. We hope that the delegates to COP27 
our governments and also other actors will look at some of these issues and pick them up as they go into the NPA negotiation. I must reiterate and report for now that already uh, the report that we are sharing today has already been shared with the Africa group of negotiators. And I hope that they can be able to take some of the views that we'll be uh, sharing here into the negotiation processes. Let me kick off why we did this. Uh, we did this by an understanding that the previous talks that we have had have not turned out to be as what we had expected them, especially for the African continent where climate change is a serious issue. We thought that perhaps the previous courts had somehow not been able to raise up the expectation of the African continent. And we thought that as civil society and other actors, we should be able to try to influence this year's court. And that explained why we crafted the, the, the topics that we had with the purpose of learning and understanding, but also sort of trying to rally together the voices from the continent in terms of shaping the discourse at COP27. We hope that this will make some change, and we hope that each of you in your different capacities will be able to influence the processes in your own countries and in your delegations. With that remark, I'll highlight a few of the areas. My colleague Theo will be posting the document in the, in the chat such that you have access to read, but in the interest of time, I'll just go through some of the sections uh, that we thought perhaps are very important and then, of course, allow you as you negotiate know, through the document to be able to make some comments. As a way of opening, we thought and we all agree that this year's COP should be about people. And the discussion and, and the discourse around climate change and just energy transition for the continent and the messaging around COP and all the frameworks within COP should be about people. Because our experience has shown that in the past, some of the discussions around issues around climate change have been so much around companies. We think that for just for just transition to happen, and we think that it cannot happen and neither can it be achieved if the majority which are affected by climate change or are likely to be affected by climate change and the energy transition which is being proposed as a mitigation measure are not had on the negotiating table. From all the discussions that we held across the continent and over this period, we have had and we have learned and we have agreed that there has to be a position and a place for the African negotiators, for the African civil societies and the African concerns to be had at the table at COP27. That's one of the key messages that we are coming up across and that we want the whole world to hear that for COP27 and the issues around climate change have a meaning, definitely the African voices must be had. And we are saying that from the literature, but also from the experience and the, and the views that we collected across the continent, which all seem to agree that despite being the least polluter, Africa is the most affected when it comes to issues around climate change and definitely it will be most affected on matters of energy transition. So we are saying that a just transition is very necessary, but it has to take into consideration uh, issues that are affecting the African continent. And we have to see that reflected by having the voices that are coming through the different positions had on the negotiating table. In the document, you will see that we have given a lot of statistics in terms of how, how far Africa has been affected and much more significant in terms of what it will take, for example, in terms of financing, the climate change and energy transition efforts on the continent. For purposes of time, I will not go into those statistics, and I'm also sure that in the different forums, you may have already have come across those different statistics and you know them. So perhaps we don't have to refer to. The other message that we are also coming through this, this uh, webinars is that because the energy transition and the climate change is also going to be anchored on issues around, around um, technology, we think that there has to be um, a resonance as well on the continent. Africa needs to transfer of environmental sound technologies from developed countries. This should harm developing countries to enable them to transit and navigate around issues around climate change. Technology needs to be harnessed and made cheaply available to mitigate the risks of climate change. And Africa should not only just be a market, but also a producer uh, of climate change mitigation technology. As a matter of essence and fairness, 
we are saying, um, or the people, participants, participants have said that let production of this, this be based on the African continent to make the use of technology as a resource. The anchor pin for this is under understanding that there's a lot of technological advancement which has been done, and there is no way that you can talk about climate change mitigation on the continent. Even if you talk about going green, but if you're talking about energy, you're talking about technology. So we want to have that as well on the continent because we have seen that uh, those advances in other, in other continents. And we don't think that the continent can be able to achieve um, or to, to be able to catch up uh, if that technology is not leveraged on the continent. The other area that we focused on during this, this, this series was around financing of a just energy transition. First of all, we said, and uh, what is coming through is that Africa must be very cognizant that there's a lot of geopolitics surrounding climate change, but also energy transition. And therefore the delegates have a unique opportunity and responsibility to ensure that they navigate around some of these geopolitical dynamics which are playing out. We know that committing ourselves to sustainable energy systems is very important, but also we understand that financing is very critical. And we understand that all these come some kind of geopolitics, but also some dynamics we have, which we have seen in the past. And we want to say that that has to be addressed and has to be looked into. And in that section, we have tried to project how that is playing out across the region and how we think that perhaps African delegates and also Africa as a continent should be responding to that, especially within the under the power view in terms of uh, achieving its own development aspirations. We also want to emphasize that financing Africa's climate change and energy transition pathways is mutually beneficial to both Africa and the developed world and those who pollute more. As by virtue of its location and current low levels of emission, Africa so far is the largest existing common sink and buffer that so far can help save the globe. So if you finance a climate, climate, climate work in Africa, definitely you'll be helping the world significantly. You'll be financing to support the buffer. You'll be financing to support the sink, which is very critical in terms of addressing the concerns uh, of the climate future. So therefore, financing Africa's climate initiative should not be as a privilege, but I think it must be a must. And I think those who are committed to do that should be able to do it. From the presentations and experts that we invited during the webinars, they identified that financing is not a problem. In fact, the money is there. The only problem is how the money is being used and where the money is going. And we think that that has to be addressed critically during this call. We have also raised issues around, around the JTIPs, the Justice Energy Partner Transition Partnership, which are being crafted at the moment, or which are being negotiated as financing mechanisms for climate change and energy transition. We are saying that just JTIPs might be good, but they must address equit equitable issues. They must be able to address both energy, but also the justice angles related to this. For example, if the just elements are specifically tackled on to make for a good sell speech, then we think that perhaps maybe the current judges might not be the, the best. We are also having some concerns in terms of uh, how transparent they have been. And of course, in terms of exactly how that money is going to reach down to the local person. The message is coming through here is that uh, we are aware and appreciate that the JTIPS can be a good way of financing but uh, the ones such as South Africa and Nego, and, and the one which is being negotiated in the Senegal, sorry for that, as financial mechanisms for energy transition, need to be con uh, conducted in a manner which is much more transparent, so which also addresses equity issues. And clearly being able to, to show how will the local citizen, someone who is affected with some of the challenges in the rural areas, in the communities, benefit from the JTIPS. We are afraid that the previous models, which are similar like these ones, have ended up being sort of really benefited those who are very close to power and those who are very close to the financing bodies. So there is also some concerns about the JTIPS structured, especially moving forward for the benefit of the continent and the people. The other message that we have also talked about in the report, which you'll receive, uh, is about how to position climate change and COP27 within the ambit of the Africa's Agenda 2063. And the message which is coming through is that Africa needs to develop or refine its vision and mission on climate change and energy transition. And this refined vision may be slightly different from the global vision. 
but it could, has to be uh, anchored and aligned Africa's vision, needs and development, determinant factors and drivers of development. For example, is it possible for Africa energy transition targets to be set along with Agenda 2063? That perhaps could be a plausible idea, especially given the context where the governments have seen, have said that it's not, it may not be possible for them to achieve net zero by 2030. So that's also a very important message, perhaps uh, which could be coming through. And we hope that African governments might be able to look at that as a, a potential uh, opportunity, but also a, a viable alternative to the 2030, which is being proposed, which in the view of the participants and the experts may be too, too, too early, given the context that we exist as a continent. And we are also saying that um, to have a just transition in Africa and governments and African people, this participation is very critical in setting both the targets, but also the setting the agenda for the COP negotiations. Listen to people's concerns first. That's the message which is coming through. Listen to Africa's concerns first, and that will be very important in moving forward the kind of achievements that we want to seek at COP27. Um, the other element that we have looked into is around issues around re renewable energy. Um, members and participants, I'm very sure that you are very aware about the discussions around re renewable energy and the, its future contribution when it comes to energy sustainability on the continent. There are targets for 100 green, and there, there are those who think that perhaps renewable energy may not be a sustainable way of going, given the challenges that we have when it comes to technology, but also coming to when it comes to systems that are, are current on the continent. There was a very extensive discussion around this topic. There was a very extensive consultation around this topic. The message which is coming from this COP, from, from, from this discussion, is that we do understand the political positions that the governments have, have taken, and especially when it comes to some of the systemic challenges that face the renewable energy sector. But we also appreciate that Africa has a huge potential. It has a, pot a huge potential for it to be able to deliver when it comes to matters related to renewable energy. And therefore, it's very important that even as we think about about the future of renewables in, with, within our energy mix, that the government should start thinking about how best they can be able to be able to improve this and their contribution to the, energy, the national energy mix by 2030. And they might also be able to look at other ways of how uh, renewable energy can be able to be, uh, to be one of the major contributors when it comes to providing uh, sustainable energy. We have written a little bit extensively about that and try to balance out the different paradigms, but also different views in terms of how best we can have a systematic move uh, towards having renewable playing a major contributing factor. Because what came out very clearly was also from the African political leadership is that perhaps we cannot talk about, uh, it may not be possible in a very short term to move away from fossils, but there has to be some kind of allowance. And therefore we are saying, yes, that could be one way, but it's very important for governments to begin thinking now. And we'd love to see how they give us uh, a pathway to us renewables. We have also talked about the importance of technology and also having that uh, technology on the African continent and having value-based uh, uh, manufacturing plants constructed on, on the continent to enable African governments to be able to be able to manufacture and bring down the costs of the technology and the plants which are required for renewable energy. There were a lot of observations which were made and questions which were made. For example, why does Africa have to be importing all the solar panels? Why does Africa have to be importing all the wind panels? Why does Africa, which seems to be having uranium, not even be able to have one uranium plant, um, a nuclear plant to produce energy? We have just tried to handle that in the report uh, with a clear message that there has to be a move uh, where these companies that are, are sort of really manufacturing are uh, renewable re re um, um, equipments, like for example, solar panels, um, wind turbines can be able to set up base on the continent because the resources are there and the potential is there. And by doing that, they'll, they'll be able to create jobs on the continent, but also be enable the countries to move faster on when it comes to uh, this, this field. Um, the final comment that we made as well on this one was that uh, we are aware that previous energy systems have promised jobs which never came. 
They promise prosperity, but bred economic injustice, marginalization, disposition, and death. We particularly point out the Marikana massacre for platinum in South Africa. And we are saying that these legacy issues must be addressed by the new energy systems and by underlying principles in defining the new just, justness in any transition. So even as we think about a transiting from fossils to renewables, all the issues that have sort of recharacterized the legacy of the fossil industry should be addressed. And we hope that COP27 can be a starting point to have those negotiations in terms of how are all these things being, going to be factored into that, such that the energy systems that we build the future are those that are built on justness, fairness, hope, and life. And we are saying that Africa cannot talk about that transition without talking about sustainable access, technology, and financing. Again, referring to our point that we raised earlier, and this must be addressed concretely. We also talked about um, energy transition, but also particularly with Africa's oil and gas and coal. And again, there was a lot of extensive discussion here. And we understood that average African consumer consumes less electricity than a fridge freezer in America. Uh, one fridge consumer for, consumes more than an average African. So it's therefore unfair to think that oil and gas projects in poor countries in Africa perhaps should be shutting down at, at, in, the, in the short term. But we also think that the dilemma is that we have to begin to think about that. And the message which is coming through from some of these discussions has been that governments must begin thinking about that. That's the, the structure for the, for, the, for the future and governments must start moving towards that direction. We had very interesting discussions around this, including our inputs from government officials and they were expressing regards why they think perhaps it might not be possible. But again, we are saying that uh, it must be the time where we begin thinking about that. And we have some messaging as well that we have crafted for the government when it comes to negotiations of what could be a potential way out when it comes to these matters. Um, the other point that we want to also, what we also to point out is that, uh, especially when we're talking about oil, gas, and all the others, that Africa should avoid the common exporting narrative in its energy systems where oil, all its extractive resources are extracted largely from external export. There is a need to inter intertrade among African countries of locally produced energy. So for those ones that, are, that have surplus can be able to trade with others which do not have, uh, which have less. And by doing that, we are able to build an integrated African continent where everybody's having access and sharing in the wealth that exists in the countries. It doesn't make sense uh, for oil or for gas, which is produced in Tanzania or in any other country to be exported. And for the oil which is produced in Nigeria or the gas to produce somewhere in Morocco to be exported of, of the continent when its people do not have energy. And we are thinking that those kind of negotiations will be very important, especially even within the parameters that we now see that, that, that are playing up at COP27, where we're having some partnership being, being discussed. So this is a very important message that we are saying that as you consider uh, these partnerships, you should also be looking at how best can Africa integrate and be able to sell uh, some of these resources in, internally. There are some positions as well that we have spoken about coal and how we see it moving forward. And of course, the resistance that we had and we have received from the governments when it comes to the future, uh, when it comes to coal. But we are saying that what's very important is that the governments at the moment should start thinking about how do they develop their energy systems without looking at themselves into a carbon, carbon future. Can coal be there for the, for the next 50 years? That's the question that we are asking and we are saying that it needs to be addressed. And we have proposed some messaging around how we can have a balance between the current and the future um, uh, on matters relating to this. We also looked at gas. Uh, friends yes, must be very I aware that gas has... If you can uh, conclude in a few minutes, uh, yes, maybe two, is... two, three minutes, yes. Great, thanks so much. This is actually my, my second last, my second last slide. So I'll be done in, in the next two minutes. So we also talked about gas and uh, the messaging there around gas. Um, I think the, me the, the messaging which is coming through is that uh, the general political feeling on the continent is that gas is a transition resource. And we are saying that there has been some discussions around that in terms of how do you balance the current needs with the future needs. And we have also given a lot um, in that area. What is very important as well, perhaps maybe to emphasize there, is that we are saying that we need to avoid COP27 becoming the place where gas for Europe becomes the main energy to be discussed. 
uh, we are saying Africa's gas should also support Africa's development. So that's one of the core messages which, which is coming through uh, the gas uh, uh, section. There was a section on, on, on critical minerals or, or, or transition minerals. And uh, I think a lot of discussions was held there. And when you receive the report, you will be reading. But we are saying that a just transition cannot be achieved if Africa's minerals, again, are exploited to serve the technologies, the technological advancement and energy security elsewhere. Africa's resources can, countries cannot be by standards in this potential. And therefore, it's very important for the governments as they negotiate at COP to be aware that it is, if it's possible, uh, how they replace their minerals that they have as well for the market, but also develop their own, own internal uh, uh, competencies. The final one that I also want to talk about a little bit is about the illicit financing clause and how perhaps this can also affect the financing of the transition, but also how it can be able to support uh, transition in country. We have noted um, from the studies and all the different infrastructure that we collected, a significant amount of resources that are lost across the continent. And we are saying that the, for Africa to be ready for, for climate change and energy transition, there is need to seal the existing financing loopholes that are facilitating for its financial flows, the tune of around 89 billion. Um, this, however, shows that Africa could meet and exceed its financing gap, especially uh, of, of US 70 billion for renewable energy if these tax loopholes are closed. We are saying that Africa is not alone when it comes to illicit financial flows. The perpetrators, most of them, are not on the continent, and that's, that has to be addressed. And perhaps one of these issues that should be discussed at COP27 will be how do we seal uh, these resources from leaving the continent and enable us to finance our, our climate, climate mitigation, our climate change efforts, but also our energy transition efforts. In a nutshell, uh, some of those are some of the messages that are coming through. There are many messages that we have highlighted in yellow when you see the report, crossing from across the different segments. And But for now, I'm happy to stop here and allow my other colleagues to join me. Once again, we want to thank you so much for, for being with us and supporting us in this journey. And we hope that we can be able to continue this discussion at COP27. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, the issues that have come out uh, over the last few, maybe close to six webinars, I believe, since April when we started. Um, as you can see, it becomes very difficult to have one common position on these issues. And so you'll find that there are quite a number of um, different uh, perceptions and views regarding um, the transition, especially in Africa. And so we're going to see a lot of those discussions, I think, take place at COP. And many of you are probably having those conversations at different uh, levels. We recently had an African mining forum in in, uh, in Addis, and, and that these critical these issues were critical on the agenda, in as far as um, the energy transition is concerned. So, without wasting time and and also not repeating what Moses has uh, labored to to share with us, I'm going to invite our next speaker to share her insights as someone who's uh, you know, in the conversations with, regarding COP, regarding the transition and some of the you know, issues that are coming out are, around this, this, this area. Um, Jacqueline Dominique Masao, I hope I've pronounced that right, uh, is a Tanzanian climate enthusiast, experienced in climate science and project management. She acquired, acquired her bachelor's degree of science in meteorology from the University of Dar es Salaam. Her interests lie, lie in the field of climate science, climate finance, nature-based solutions, citizen science, and policy reforms. Currently, um, Ms. Jacqueline is working with Can Africa as the assistant coordinator, engaging in organizing and mobilizing local voices for enhance, enhancement of climate resilience in the region. So Jackie, you're welcome. It would be interesting to hear your perceptions and views given some of the issues that we've raised through these webinars. And also just looking at um, the current perspective and some of the conversations you're having at your level in preparation to COP, and maybe also you know that around climate change and how that fits within this this agenda that we're discussing. So I will give you about five or so minutes, five to ten minutes for your intervention, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. You're welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you very much, Nelly. Um, 
for last introduce my name is Jacqueline Masao and I'm based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So I'll just jump right into my intervention as um, I do not have much time. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to appreciate and um, congratulate the organizing team for this good initiative that has been uh, has started all the way from March to the moment. Um, and I must acknowledge how important um, these discussions are in terms of um, trying to create a common position, but um, also trying to align and bring the whole um, the African communities um, into the same page, especially around issues of transition and also around issues of uh, climate resilience. So I'll, I'll give a perspective from Khan and um, some of the observations that I have had uh, based on various interactions that we just had. Apologies if the background noise, I'm kind of like in an open environment, I must say. Uh, but please bear with me um, because I make my intervention. Um, uh, my, I'll address uh, my concerns in, into three categories, especially around policy and then the politics, which always is kind of like the, the organ that operates and keep things moving, but also around coordination, especially now that we're going through, um, we're going towards the COP27 in itself. Um, especially uh, beginning first with the issues around the policy. Um, so around um, the issues around um, transitioning, uh, we feel like uh, first and foremost, um, one of the concerns that um, we, we have, it, it's, a lot, it's around like we, as a continent, we really need to have, um, to identify and define what just transition is. Uh, based on the different contexts and geographic um, locations that we have. But then um, with that, we'll be able to be able to have like um, the common objective of, of where the transition needs to, to come in. Um, especially when we say transition, when you normally speak with, with the governments, especially the African governments, they feel like it needs to happen uh, right on and just as soon as possible. But uh, we need to also understand um, this uh, is a long time. Uh, we need to have a long term vision, like of, in terms of transition, and also how do we um, envision it to be? How do we also bring in uh, various stakeholders um, and youth to play uh, to play part in, in, in terms of uh, transition? And this transition just doesn't uh, remain in the energy transition, but a transition in the whole spectra and ensuring that there is just transition leaving no one behind. But also, how do we also ensure like um, uh, but the continent as the continent we're more resilient um, and we, 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 I, we also do have adaptation and some of the like uh, the positions that as can we, we want to take on especially for COP towards COP in, in the policy spectrum it's also allow, around the adaptation given the needs of the continent um, adaptation and we know we have now the global pollen adaptation discussions that are going on but we also want them to be affirmed through this COP and also issues around loss and damage. How uh, do we address all of these issues? As we have seen this year in itself, um, uh, there is quite huge um, drought uh, within the uh, great corner of, of Africa, but we have also witnessed uh, flooding within the communities, especially in the Western Africa. Um, in terms of also like mitigation um, with the energy stresses that are going on in, in Europe, especially at the moment, how do we ensure that um, those um, energy stress does not really fall back to meet uh, the commitments that uh, as developed countries that they have made, but also how as um, African as the continent, how do we stand firm to ensure that um, our commitments, but our development also are not being swayed out uh, by the energy stress and the needs and the demands of energy within the Europe itself, but how do we also look into uh, uh, linking that with the transitioning in terms of energy transition and adapting to renewable energy solutions, looking into solutions that are more sustainable and more affordable, but also solutions that uh, will enhance the development of the continent at large. And then around financing, um, which is quite um, an interesting topic when you speak about it in, in African context. Uh, financing, you would hear financing for adaptation, financing for loss and damage, uh, that being the key discussions, uh, one of the hot topics that will be around COP, 
but also how do you also finance and uh, the plan for transition it, um, ensuring that our communities are becoming much more resilient. resilient. Um, in terms of politics, um, the COP space has been um, largely um, disrupted by uh, geopolitics uh, that are going on. Developed countries trying to um, to corrupt and disrupt the developing countries uh, in terms of like uh, having a common position, especially around the positions that we 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 put forth in terms of trying to create the resilience for the community. And this has also been trying to create um, dependency to keep on that dependency um, in terms of uh, African countries trying to keep on depending on developed countries. That way, uh, for them, they, they balance the demand and supply issues. But also another politics that is coming up in the name of transition and in the name of green solution, um, it's also um, selling out of these false solutions. <coughs> <clears throat> selling out false solutions and some of the dangerous disruptions that are labeled as green solutions. So how do we ensure that um, that transition also looks into all of these solutions, ensuring that whatever that we um, we engage in and commit to as, uh, as the continent also um, bring forth the development and does not exacerbate the climate impacts. Um, another, maybe this could also be on a political side, um, looking into COP, how do we also like influence the developed countries, the actually the major political uh, leaders to be present in, into this space to ensure that um, some of the, to enhance commitments, but also to enhance um, some of the issues around finance and issues around um, the transition in terms of energy and just transitioning itself, like what are, the committed, uh, what are the countries committing themselves? And this can only be done also when we have um, our, the, the leaders uh, from Africa and the leaders within the, the, the globe itself um, uh, present at COP27. Um, we want this to be a COP27, uh, a COP27 to be a people's COP. But yes, in terms of coordination, I still, I, I still feel like there's a concern that um, this is lacking in many ways, especially around issues of equity or issues of access, um, issues around budgets, um, visa issues and auto cancellations that have been going on at the moment um, ahead of COP. So how do we also like ensure these uh, would bring forth uh, the people to be the center of the discussion and whatever that the discussions that are being brought about truly reflect the needs and the capacity of the people of Africa itself. So I'll just end here with my patience and um look for much more discussion. Thank you many. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, you've brought out some very pertinent issues. And, and one of the things I think you're emphasizing also is around the financing issue um, that also Moses had highlighted. And I think the last point you make there is very critical, and maybe it's perhaps something that we should also consider uh, highlighting in our in the issues paper as well, especially around the people's COP. But actually, in reality, it's quite lacking there because of some of the challenges that people are facing just accessing um, the logistics and, and all that, and the visas, like you're mentioning, and the budgets. It's becoming increasingly difficult for many organizations and, and people generally to even access it. So it doesn't make sense, especially on issues that pertain to the, the communities and the beneficiaries that we work for um, to be able to, to raise some of these issues. Um, in, in, in it's, it's very critical, I think, that we need to consider. But also um, the issues you're talking about, energy access, I think are very critical. And it's um, and 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 the the, the the whole concept of just energy transition, I think, something that we really need to discuss um, very critically um, during as we you know in the lead up to COP. Of course, the conversation doesn't stop here, 
Um, if you have comments uh, to our audience, if you have any comments, please share them in the chat. I'm sure some of the things that are being raised resonate with, with what you're working on at the moment um, in your different capacities. So please feel free to use the chat. And also if you have any Q&A, uh, please use the chat, the Q&A tab. Um, our next speaker um, is also going to share his, his uh, views and, and commentary on what we're discussing. Um, Philip Kilonzo is a programs policy and campaign prof professional who has served in the development field over the last 19 years in the diverse sector. He has leadership experience on policy and campaigns in advancing social justice for women, young people, smallholder farmers, and excluded populations leading work in the land, in land and natural resources, climate change, humanitarian extractives, and in advancing the right to food and climate resilient practices in the agriculture sector. Uh, Philip serves as the head of policy advocacy and communication uh, at the Pan-Africa Climate Justice Alliance, which uh, many of us know as PAPJA. Um, so Philip, as you come in at this point, I'd uh, love you to speak to, you know, some of the issues that Moses also raised and what Jacqueline has been talking about and your perspective, especially as we go to COP, I think the general debate has, has been whether Africa has a position or whether governments are ready to really negotiate to the point where they are considering and putting on a lot of consideration for their people. And so there's been a lot of different views, varying views, especially around financing, technology, uh, access, and all that. So we'd love to hear from you and also what's happening in the PAPJA um, movement and, and what are your um, issues and, and some of the things that you see uh, are really key for this discussion. So over to you, Philip. I'll also give you about five to 10 minutes. I'd like us to just um, yeah, begin to, to hear from the audience as well. Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Nelly. I think uh, the floor was quite set by Moses in uh, his presentation. Uh, initially, I, I think you've set new terms of reference, which I'm <laughs> trying to see how best to address within uh, yes, uh, that I'm period. Glad you're ready. <laughs> yes. Yeah, without necessarily biting my tongue. But I think Moses made uh, quite uh, a good presentation that can actually be a basis for articulating a few things, uh, particularly from uh, the position of Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance. But of course, where I'm also deviating from that to personal views, I'll also be quite explicit around that. Uh, let me begin by uh, basically saying that um, the priorities for Africa, particularly for COP27, are not in contestation and they are quite clear, quite across. And I think the extreme weather events that are climate motivated across the continent has clearly uh, sort of sharpened the focus in terms of priorities for the continent uh, to revolve largely around adaptation and addressing issues of loss and damage. So uh, COP27 then essentially must be an impact COP uh, centering on people's uh, needs, Africa people's needs and priorities and particularly looking at how best can African community uh, be well supported to adapt, and how best can we address issues of losses and damage uh, within the communities uh, where we come from. And I think that is extremely important. You will hear my, uh, my big references to communities, to um, communities, uh, and specifically referring to communities who are living uh, or who are at the front line of climate crisis, which is extremely critical in this particular conversation. But for that to happen, then uh, there, there is an overarching priority around climate finance, uh, making sure that funding uh, to address adaptation needs, issues of loss and damage, and broadly transitions, and uh, does indeed happen. So that indeed becomes quite a priority. And we are basically saying that the funding itself must be accessible to communities in the front line of a climate crisis. And then, of course, uh, uh, thirdly, is a broad question of. Um, uh, just transition for Africa, just to, uh, of course, it's just first and foremost to communities in the continent and just again to governments. So that again, it broadly supports uh, the development and the aspirations of the continent, uh, which is extremely important. But looking backward, you will see that there was an overarching uh, strive for Africa to be indeed recognized as a continent with special needs and special circumstances. Uh, that still remains a back burner strife. 
uh, in uh, uh, and, and strangle that again, uh, Pan African Climate Justice Alliance and its membership uh, is actually pursuing within COP27, and indeed uh, there is quite a, a significant uh, number of allies. Coming back to the topic and trying to tie it, I can see there there, there is an indeed a discussion and discourse around extraction, and. Uh, in many cases, extractive sector is actually carbon intense. Uh, we see a lot of, whether it's mining, whether it's oil extraction, whether it's minerals for development, indeed you see a lot of carbon being released out of it. But again, Africa is also home to most of the transitional minerals, minerals that are being used within the transition discourse in the energy sector, and that is uh, important. But then again, the minerals become quite important, particularly in terms of dealing with uh, the, 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 energy, the, the energy question, uh, which is at the center of this particular discussion. But as we, we begin looking at the extractive sector, then we are looking at broad trade, and the capital issues, uh, which again, we must begin to rationalize within uh, uh, the discourse of just transition. But what are we basically saying uh, is that, um, and, and in most of our position is that uh, Africa indeed has resources and these resources can be earnest uh, to develop the continent. And these resources can actually support in part uh, just transition. But what is just in this particular case for a country that has oil, the oil is still lying underground and they don't have other resources and they don't have other forms of power. Uh, what does it mean in this particular case? What does it mean for an African country that has uh, oil resources, essentially underground, its people are poor and they cannot access that oil and uh, the people continue to languish in poverty. And what kind of then trade investment and trade deals should uh, ideally happen within that particular realm to ensure that communities benefit rather than just extracting oil to meet um, and, uh, uh, energy deficiencies in, uh, in, in the north, because that has been the trend. Uh, and again, how do we deal with broadly uh, the question of energy property, linking that to the extractive sector? I think that is extremely important, even as we have this particular uh, conversation. But I think the underlying element then therefore is that uh, the transition itself, whether it's in the extractive sector, whether it's in the energy sector, must be indeed people-centered. People-centered meaning that it takes indeed priorities and needs of the, the local communities. And the, the local communities are not only in center of being served in terms of meeting their needs, but beginning to see how, uh, at what extent can they control, access and control. Uh, the sector. And, 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 and again, I'm, I'm building this perspective no, pretty well knowing that um, the energy sector is uh, indeed one of the, the sector that has been uh, quite colonized, quite colonized. And uh, indeed, it, 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 it is um, a sector that is quite pivotal to transformation in, in, in terms of our lives, livelihoods of people and changing their immediate condition. But it's heavily colonized. Uh, and, and indeed serves our foreign capital. So how do we ensure that as we, we now answer our narratives around extractives and the transition within the energy sector, we are able to support a paradigm that, that pushes for people-centered energy systems that transfer not only benefits, uh, but also control of the actual resources and the profits out of the investments to the local community. So that again, a lot of wealth begins to trickle back to, uh, to, to the country. This morning, I was actually having an interesting conversation from um, uh, one um, community group that called me early in the morning. They wanted to know how best they, they are going to engage with uh, people who want to go down to their village to invest in solar and wind power. And my, and my arguments were, were quite clear and quite apt that the communities must have a stake, not only in terms of a uh, uh, informing the decision, but also beginning to set the priorities and beginning to claim equity stake within the investment, which is extremely critical. And that indeed then underpins the kind of then negotiation and the kind of push that we need to see uh, within COP27, because ideally capital is fighting for its own space. So that's something that I must emphasize when you begin to listen to all the conversations that are forming uh, formative to COP27, you can actually hear capital beginning to fight for its own space through um, undeveloped countries. And as it fights for its own space, then we begin to look at what is the position and what is the role of local people and African communities within the discourse of the transition, because the discourse of transition are actually being uh, coined in an investment-oriented language. That investment-oriented language may not necessarily um, place at the center local communities unless we are quite uh, agile and quite um, 
uh, active in terms of pressing for a, a, a structure in terms of uh, that, that, that uh, in, the, in terms of the design of that transition to place communities at the center. So that's something that I'm really trying to uh, rub in because it's indeed important to look at how that plays out within uh, the context. But we must then broadly, without necessarily uh, bringing in competitions with our core priorities as Africa, begin to position uh, transition in a much more broad sense. Uh, so that the transitional conversation is not just tied to the energy sector, but cuts across uh, all the other sectors. We begin to see then, if we are talking about um, uh, transition, we begin to see energy within a much more broader uh, spectrum, much more broader spectrum to look at um, what kind of transitions within energy sector will enable adaptation within agriculture sector and will enable us deal with uh, or even limit instances of losses and damage and will actually support uh, the industrialization that, that is so much desirous within the context of Africa. We must see uh, that uh, beginning to bear fruit because when you look at uh, power rates and power tariffs within the continent, again, they remain at all point I compared with other areas. And uh, that is not an incentive for investment. And therefore, um, uh, again, again, you can see investment being eroded and Africa remaining as a continent of raw material rather than being able to add value and play much more strategic role within the, the mineral value chain. So that must be then iteratively uh, connected so that the just um, a transition conversation within the energy sector is, is, is slightly broader than how it is indeed framed. I think it is indeed in the energy conversation and the just transition uh, uh, conversation that are uh, locked to, uh, to the energy domain where we uh, essentially lose in our priority setting within COP. And that is where, again, some certain articles, particularly the Paris article related to financing and the, uh, the source of the funding uh, for climate change, and again, the mechanisms within which it should be delivered are lost. And it is lost because uh, essentially, we, we, uh, most of the governments within African continent uh, are, are basically looking at how best to leverage on resources that are available uh, to, to promote investments in energies under the critical sector. And that is where, again, the fundamentals around the Paris Agreement in terms of developing, developing developed countries uh, being able to provide uh, funding that is needed to respond to climate change is indeed lost. I want to go back and begin to uh, ask some certain fundamental questions related to, one, if Africa is transiting, at whose cost is it transiting? Because that is an, uh, an, 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 an headline question, because unless we are able first and foremost to uh, crystallize and be clear in terms of at whose cost are we essentially transiting, then we begin to lose uh, the, the essence of the discussion and we get into trade related arrangements rather than really um, uh, upholding and ensuring that we are able to spearhead the spirit of Paris um, agreement because um, unless we are able to spearhead then we lose it it becomes climate change becomes real business and real trade and indeed um, uh, central to uh, trade organizing those who have been following uh, John Kerry uh, the U.S. Um, a special envoy um, uh, on issues of climate change uh, must have been uh, able to note uh, some of the sentiments that is uh, churning out, basically saying that Africa countries have not developed appropriate investment uh, policies that can actually pull capital that is lying somewhere, uh, either in Europe or in the US. And, and that in itself is a dangerous conversation because essentially it means you are basically um, uh, telling African countries to Liber, uh, um, uh, make their markets much more liberal to attract that particular capital, rather than look, looking at the broader justice question in regard to uh, those who are responsible for emitting more, uh, taking much more responsibility in that particular regard. So that's something that uh, I think is important we, we put in context. I think we've been with the sun uh, and the wind is always with us. Uh, and, and, and therefore we are not discovering anything new within the transitional discussion. I think what is important then is technology. And again, technology is highly colonized, um, colonized to the extent that we import solar panels across Africa continent rather than manufacturing them locally. Uh, we are importing a lot of our materials related to wind, wind, wind power rather than again being in position to manufacture uh, some of these uh, materials locally. 
The extent to which then we approach uh, COP27 with a strive to push for decolonization of technology, decolonization um, of capital, th 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 then that is uh, the time we'll, we'll come back and say we've made uh, quite a, a significant uh, uh, progress in that particular uh, regard. But then uh, just then to uh, begin to end uh, is again to highlight the fact that um, the COP discussions, COP27 discussions are not beginning now. They began earlier around June uh, when we had uh, the SB meeting and, 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 and the pre-COP meeting and AMSEN meeting and even uh, the pre-COP uh, meeting in, um, in uh, DRC uh, from the COP, uh, the COP presidency. Those were all framing sessions. Is the African narrative un united in this regard? I'll say there is a strive to unite, but there is also massive forces uh, to uh, split uh, the African narrative. And essentially, um, uh, this is driven um, by capitalistic oriented um, uh, narratives that again are able to uh, now once on opportunity or are able to anchor on opportunities that are presented by uh, the, the, the Africa investment environment. And therefore, for us, it, it, it is indeed important to keep looking at um, how best do we uh, then approach COP27 uh, in a much more uh, collective and uh, coherent manner. So I just want to uh, really pause there uh, because it, it is indeed important we continue these conversations and ensure we we, we've uh, sort of found it up. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you for the insights and the perspective. You brought um, very interesting uh, perspectives there also around uh, technology being heavily colonized, um, but also what you started with on, on the people's, on, on the, the people, the priorities of the local people, I think is very important. But I think one thing that you also mentioned that was really critical is that the minerals that are critical for the transition are in Africa. And I think we need to really be debating what that actually means. I think one of the things I'm hearing is also that Africa governments are going to cope with the position that they will continue extracting um, you know, oil, gas, and, and these other minerals, and those revenues will be used for the transition. And so that is also debatable within our constituency here. So we, we need to really understand what, what is in it for Africa and what the just transition means for Africa and, and the potential impact um, the transition has also on the minerals that on Africa in, in relation to the minerals that are, are, are key for the transition. Um, there is a question in the q and I wonder if you can take it at some point. I don't know if there are questions from the audience. I was um, I have a few minutes for anyone who wants to raise their hand and say something, a comment perhaps, or maybe in addition to what we're discussing, the paper that we presented, uh, that Moses presented, uh, we, we are sharing it widely. And if there is any additional input that you'd like to send us, please do send it to us. Maybe we can put in some emails there, Theo, maybe Moses, you could add your email in the chat. As we as we finalize and 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 um, get ready with those messages uh, ahead of COP and sharing with our different stakeholders, um, Moses, you've heard from um, Philip. Jacqueline has had to leave. She's uh, uh, coordinating a meeting around COP as well in Tanzania, so she can't stay with us until the end. But Moses, you've heard from both of our speakers and also just a few messages in the chat that have come through. And you can tell that you know people are, are, I guess there is a bit of anxiety somewhere also in terms of what COP really means, but also what the transition in general means. So as we begin to start wrapping up, I just wanted to hear your reflections, but also in terms of where Africa needs to position itself. I think it's clear that we may not come with a very major common position as Africa, the contexts are different. And also the views and perceptions are different, but I think there has to be a, a, a better understanding and a common understanding of these issues. So Moses, I'll allow you to say a few words there um, as you share your, your reflections from the feedback we've got and also the, uh, from our speakers. But I'll also allow the participants to please raise your hand if you want to say something, and then we can begin to, to wrap up and share some concluding actions. Uh, for the next mm. step. So Moses, please go ahead. 
great indeed, Nelly. I'll try to be to, to be to be brief. Yes, because I think also there is also just also to announce that there is also um, another webinar which is which will be starting shortly at at one thirty for the for the Francophone Africa uh, organized by Publish What You Pay. So that's why we will try as much as possible to be um, a, a little bit on time just to allow other people to transit that that one as well. Um, Thanks indeed. I think very, very critical points from coming from Philip and Jacqueline, as usual, are uh, definitely resonating with some of the concerns that have been going on across the, the, the continent, and especially in terms of the feelings that we think that as we go to COP27, that that has to be sort of really our bare minimum requirements. This COP talking about people should be at the center. So that's one common, common, common denominator. And I, and I think that also came out clearly through the paper uh, in terms of where we want to see uh, the voices of the people really sort of taking center stage rather than capital and the others. Um, in terms of, uh, I think on matters of, of, of just transition, some of them we have dealt with them extensively in the document. We try to capture um, a lot of views from the different angles. But I think the summary that uh, Philip says is was very fundamental. As you sit on that negotiating table, representing your government, representing your country, representing your CSO, I think the question should be, if we are transiting, where we are transiting from where to where, at what cost and for who? So I think once you put that into the equation, that can sort of really change fundamentally. And especially when you add that that denominator, the person. And when I say the person, you're talking about the ordinary African citizen who does not have access to electricity and who may not have access to you know, other forms of energy. So that, that discussion is very critical. And I think that could be the center of the discussion. And then all this is about equity, access uh, become um, core to that discussion. Um, there is a question in the chat in terms of what's the place of energy efficiency in the just transition conversation. Of course, uh, it's a very critical point, and I think it has to be addressed significantly. Because when you talk about energy efficiency, you're talking about input output. For how much, uh, to what, how much cost are you incurring to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity? And how are you distributing that efficiently in a manner that allows it to reach the final consumer cheaply, but also afford affordably? And this is what we are saying, that uh, energy access for, for Africa should be very critical. The energy systems that we develop should ensure that they are efficient and they allow for the people to have access to that energy. So that means that, for example, if you're building a renewable energy systems, which we think should actually be scaled up in one way or another, then you're sort of addressing these issues because then they can be very to our cost and affordable. So putting people at the core of is very important in this transition. That's why we have talked about equity and access. Can my mother in the village afford to get access to energy? Can he get can she get it reliably? And how can she get that energy? So those questions are, are sort of going to be quite fundamental at COP27. Um, I think um, in the interest of time, I wouldn't want to go into details for the other, but I think those are sort of really central to the kind of uh, issues that are, are coming through. Davis yeah. asks a final question. Is there a minimum that parties in Africa would like to see come out of the COP27? Perhaps maybe I will leave this to Philip to answer or to you, Nelly, to answer if you if you want him to take. There should be. And some of them are the ones that have raised the paper, but I'm happy to yield time to my other colleagues to make, the, make it a contribution to this. Yeah. Thank you, Moses. I was actually going to ask uh, Philip to respond to that question, um, but there are very good comments in the chat and in the Q&A tab that I think we need to take note of. Um, I saw a comment from Charles and I think someone else about what we need to consider as we go to COP. Uh, Philip, I want to allow you to respond to those questions, but any comments that she has taken in, has taken your interest. As we conclude, because as Moses mentioned, there is another webinar that has started and would love for people to have an opportunity to join it. 
Um, but um, as you conclude, as you respond to those, that feedback and, and some of the questions you're seeing, if you can just also share your concluding remarks and, and then we can share the next steps uh, from here in, in two minutes or less, Philip. <laughs> Nelly, I can see you are, you are paid to ensure that I have no tank. <laughs> I, I think it, in yeah. terms of um, minimums that we would like to see, uh, come out of COP. I think from a just energy, uh, the, the just, just transition perspective from the energy point of view, uh, what, what would be critical is to see countries recommitting uh, to cut down on their emission. Uh, that, that is what probably would be our minimum in terms of um, uh, per pursuit uh, in COP and, and really demonstrating that they are moving towards cutting on their emission. Because if you look at um, the IPCC report and the direction it's pointing us to in terms of um, uh, the, the, the earth temperature and, and, and the occurrences, we have no choice but to cut on emission. Unfortunately, we are not seeing that because we are seeing develop, de developed countries um, uh, sort of going back to the old way, ways of doing things, restocking in terms of coal, doing more oil prospecting within public lands and offshore. Uh, that's a dilemma. We are also seeing African countries uh, also are struggling to join uh, the League of Oil Producing and all that. So those struggles are there and definitely those struggles will play within COP. But in a more precise manner in the other thematic areas, uh, I think we are clear that we'd like to see in COP uh, doubling of investments on adaptation. Uh, that, that is extremely key, uh, really scaling up, doubling, recommitting, and ensuring that that funding is flowing as fast as it can to enable uh, African communities to adapt. Uh, the third, of course, which should have been the first, is then a mechanism for addressing loss and damage being put in place uh, in COP27. Just commenting briefly, I think uh, having a unified African position on issues of um, a transition within the energy sector is not, is not so easy because when it comes to issues of um, uh, oil, you will find African countries are also fragmented into almost three tiers, depending on where they are in the whole um, uh, uh, in the whole pipeline of our oil business, and and, there, and therefore those variations again play in within the same context in in such a big way. So it is indeed important to note that uh, that position might not be unified. But coming to the question that Innocent raised, which looked innocent. When you begin to look at energy efficiency from a just uh, transition perspective, and I want to use the case of um, a coal plant that was being proposed to be built in Lamu, uh, uh, th then that comes to bear uh, because uh, we we are we are now we now begin to look at um, the mega uh, power generation plants and the cost of transmission and how much power is actually lost within the transmission process and what is the cost of transmission. Uh, because when you look at the cost of transmission, the energy loss during transmission, then you begin to realize that much of the efficiency that ideally should have been enjoyed is lost in that particular process. And therefore, from a just uh, transition uh, perspective, then you begin to look at, suppose you send these energy systems closer to communities, suppose you make them controlled by, by communities, um, uh, what kind of benefits will, will, will this create? Number one, it will reduce the energy loss during transmission and the investments for transmission, but more important, it will create much more people-centered economies around the energy sector, which is extremely critical. So even as we go to COP27, I think the fundamentals are clearly cut out in terms of how do we make the energy uh, sector begin to send uh, around, around, uh, around people. I think there was a comment around polluter pay principle. Um, polluter pay principle is um, quite a useful principle, but also uh, uh, my apology is quite a useless uh, principle. Uh, useless principle because uh, right now the conversations that are, are having uh, a lot of difficulties center around that. Developed countries with decades of pollution and those decades of pollution again have led to us to where we are and we are suffering the consequences of decades of pollution from developed countries. Are they willing to pay? Have they been able to demonstrate uh, their, their stewardship towards paying for the losses and damages their pollution has caused over time? Uh, that is uh, uh, still a pertinent question, and it begins to speak uh, to the difficulties around that. It indeed again begins to then to negate 
um, uh, the, the efforts that are, uh, uh, the, the efforts and the push that we are putting on developed countries to cut on their emission because they can say actually we will pursue uh, um, uh, the polluter pays principles and continue to live in our lifestyle and meet, um, uh, uh, meet our energy targets. But that is not the case. It should be indeed um, a, a global push towards cutting on emission. You cannot basically say Africa can um, uh, adopt a low carbon uh, development pathway, but high carbon development pathway is ideal for developed countries. That's double speak, which we must ensure that it does not happen in COP27. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Philip. Thank you a lot uh, for those insights. Um, Right, so there's just one, I think, last comment from David in the chat. I want us to conclude. Um, I'll conclude, I think, with this question or comment, I believe. Um, does Africa have a COP like platform that meets more regularly where the African agenda can be curated regularly for meeting at the main COP? I believe that is happening, Philip, if I'm not mistaken, but maybe not as co well coordinated because I think there are different platforms where people are meeting. Philip, could you speak to that very briefly? Um, well, th thanks for that question. In indeed, uh, PACT has done quite a lot in terms of uh, convening um, uh, constant dialogues, and those dialogues are not uh, uh, divorced from uh, the UN UNFCCC process, and um, uh, whoever, uh, whichever country is actually the convener of our uh, COP at that particular time. Uh, this particular year, we've worked quite closely to COP27 uh, uh, presidency, that is Egypt, uh, ensuring that all the meetings and all the conversations that we've held, right from um, uh, the, the, the quick preview meeting that we had in Cairo after COP26, which really uh, enabled us to do a quick dissection of the issues uh, and a, a sideline meeting that we had in uh, uh, Africa Union um, uh, Summit in Addis Ababa and, and a further meeting, deeper meeting uh, in the silence of our Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development Goals and our engagement in SB56, uh, a deeper engagement in AMSEN and now uh, planning for CCDA and also the pre-COP in um, uh, the pre-COP that happened in uh, DRC. Basically, uh, PACT has been able to convene quite uh, conversations that are directed towards that particular platform. But coming to next year, we are thinking differently and you will hear from us, Davis. I think Davis, I have your number if you are not an old friend. Uh, and, 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 and we'll be able to see then how do we mm -hmm. structure it even, it even much more strong, strongly as we air to uh, the next process. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Um, so I guess it needs also, I guess, a bit of coordination because I know even within civil society, there have been so many groups that have been convening different forums and platforms and coordinating with uh, the UNFCC uh, platforms and COP27, um, you know, groups and, and all that. So I guess there is a bit of coordination that we need to enhance as we move along. But Philip, thank you so much for that insight. And maybe you could share your email for people who want more information in terms of some of those platforms that you're familiar with uh, that lead up to, to many of these COP events. Um, as we get to the conclusion, thank you very much for every, uh, everybody for joining in. Um, there is a comment about the recording. Yes, if you registered and joined this uh, webinar, definitely you receive um, a recording. I believe we will share the recording. Uh, but also, if you want to share more comments, we've sent the issues paper on the chat, and maybe Theo can send it quickly for those who have just joined. But we've sent it at, we sent it at the beginning um, of the webinar through the chat. If you want to share any feedback or any additional comment, please do send it to this email that I've just typed in that belongs to Moses. And then we'll coordinate uh, with, with the, among us ourselves on how we, we prepare and finalize and then send out uh, the, the messages along with our respective organizations. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to Philip. Thank you to Jacqueline, who has not uh, been able to finish the, the, the webinar, but was uh, very critical at the beginning. I don't know, Moses, if there is any last minute remark, but I think we are set to, to end. And then for those who'd like to, to send us comments, they can send you email. Uh, is that all, Moses? I think that should be it. Yes, thank you, Nelly. That's all. And definitely we wish you the best. And uh, for those who will be traveling to Egypt, uh, we wish you the best. I think keep the fire going. Uh, definitely these documents will be there and we shall, we shall constantly interact in the different yeah. uh, sessions. 
but we want to say we have been, been so grateful uh, for all the support that you provided us throughout, throughout this journey. And we want to yes. thank Professor Hunter Kiamba, I saw you from Fred Kabanda, you joined us this morning, and all the others that you are not able to mention. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, and also a, a big appreciation to all the coordinating organizations who have been part of this process since April. The work is not yet done, so all the organizations, Oxfam, Tax Justice Network Africa, uh, Echo News, NRGI, Publisher to Pay, um, Power Shift Africa, and all those that have really contributed to this process. Thank you. So I think the after call, perhaps like, there will probably be a couple of conversations that will happen um, just to see where we are at and also just looking at reflecting on what happened at COP27. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to you all and I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.